And so you're doing, you're, you're acting two successful shows, um, and then you, you decide to open night, a nightclub. No, I opened the nightclub in 1981 when I was on the Jeffersons. I didn't open it later, I opened it in 81. What made because you want to open two, a nightclub? Two uh, black ladies came to see me over at the theater on Vermont where, where we had, where we did 227, where we did a lot of other plays. And my daughter was running Crossroads Academy. These ladies said, Miss Gibbs, we said, if anybody knows you would. She said, she said when our, our uh, friends come to town, we have to take them out of the neighborhood all the time. Do you know any place in the neighborhood where we could take our friends? I couldn't think of anything. I sent everybody to the warehouse at the marina. That was one of my favorite restaurants. Mm -hmm. So um, I was trying to open a, a jazz coffee shop at the top of the theater. But the architect said, no, the planes are coming. This is a terrible idea. So uh, in the meantime, there was a psychic friend of mine. So I went over to her in Hollywood and we were supposed to go see Bustin' Loose, but we couldn't find it. So we got in the car and we we're going up and down Hollywood Boulevard and, and Sunset, and the traffic is bumper to bumper. So when we got to Wilton, I turned right and got out of the traffic. Well, Wilton takes you down to Arlington and Marla's Memory Lane, at that time the Memory Lane, was right off Arlington. So I said, well, let's go here, O.C. Smith. So she said, okay, I said, have some dinner. So we got there and we went in. So we went into the dining room and they said, well, the chef said, the kitchen is closed, but she'll be very happy to make you two chicken dinners. I said, we'll take it. So while we're sitting there eating the chicken, Larry Hearn, the owner of, of uh, Memory Lane came in. He said, what you doing? So I didn't want to tell him I was opening a coffee shop, you know, compared to what he was doing. So I said, oh, nothing, everything. So he asked me again, about three sentences later. I said, well, actually, I'm getting ready to open a, a coffee shop, a jazz coffee shop. He said, well, why don't you buy this place? I said, oh, Larry, you're not going to sell this place. He said, I am. He said, but I wanted somebody that's going to pay me. I don't know if I'm sell it to nobody <laughs> and hear a story. So, so I said, and next door was a house that went with it. He owned the house, too. I said, well, OK. Let's, I'll buy the house for $50,000. And uh, what we'll do while we're in escrow, if everything goes well, if it doesn't, I'll have the house, you know. So he said, okay. So we went through, we got the funding and everything. So I had it. I didn't know that he had Dobermans watching the place. I kept thinking that was an odor. But I thought something was wrong with the bathroom. But the Dobermans <laughs> were cutting loose in there <laughs> and nobody was really cleaning it that well. So you had that odor. So I, of course, remodeled um, and made it Marla's Memory Lane. I kept it Memory Lane, just added Marla. And it became very popular. And I was dating a jazz musician and uh, everybody was saying jazz is dead. So I said, how could our music be dead? So I started hiring jazz musicians, so I had the reputation of being the only person hiring the jazz musicians. How and long did that stay open? it turned into a very successful very venue. Very successful. How long did it stay open? Except for money. Except for money? I needed, I needed a, another manager who knew how to run the business. How long did it stay open? Uh, we were open from 81 to, 90, to 99. Oh, wow, that's very successful. But that's because I kept putting money in. Kept putting your own money into it. People would come sometimes, and instead of buying the food, they would come in with a box of chicken or something hidden, and then they'd leave the box down there so I could see what they did. I didn't understand it. And then people would come on a Sunday. I had brunch. I had a champagne brunch. They'd come with four or five people and asked me to come outside and take pictures with the people, and I would. So I said, why don't you all come on in? He said, no, we've got reservations at the marina. So people have a lot of nerve. <laughs> they do. You come and ask me to come out of my business, take a picture with you to go to another business. <laughs> Bartenders sometimes, they would have somebody, a friend come in, and they would um, 
give them a drink and they pay and then they give them two pieces of change they ain't paid for nothing you know mm. or they would sell their liquor and leave my liquor on the shelf so a lot of things that went down that caused me to lose a lot of money yeah People and I was still working. Business. You can't watch everything. Right. And speaking of still working, you you continue to work. Well, that's what you do when you're 30. <laughs> you keep working. <laughs> Forever young. It, winning multiple awards, uh, seven double A N double A. You won multiple awards, seven double A C P N double A C P awards. Uh, I think it was eight. Yeah. I stand corrected. Eight more movies, more television. Do you have a preference, movies or television? Whoever's paying me, honey. <laughs> <laughs> you continue to work to this day. I, I, I'm curious as to what inspired Marla Gibbs. Who inspires Marla Gibbs? What inspires you? I like working. I like particularly acting because you get to be another character. You get to have other experiences other than your life. And I, I like that. It's a love. So we're in the process right now of writing a book. Everybody's talked to me about writing a book. I keep saying, about what? Because you never think your life is that important. But we're starting to write the book. We're in the midst of it now. And I'm beginning to like it. And, and your daughter, Angela, was telling me the title of it. It's never too late. It's never too late. Yeah, at the end of 2006, I mean, in the middle of 2006, I did a CD called It's Never Too Late. And about four in the morning, I was telling God, I would like a song to go with this title. So about four o'clock in the morning, he gave me all the words. And so I called H.B. Barnum, who produced it, and I sang it to his service, because after all, it was four in the morning, <laughs> his answering service. And so I wouldn't forget it and went back to sleep, but I never forgot it. The words, the music, everything. Well, not the music, but the sound, everything. And, and he did it with a big band and I just loved it. But by the end of the year, end of the year in October, end of October, I had an an a brain aneurysm. And uh, so we never did go on with it. You still you have any plans to could uh, maybe continue that? When we do the book, we're gonna release finally release the CD. Okay, okay. And do you think because it's never too late? It's never too late. <laughs> exactly. Would you say your love for what you do is what keeps you young and youthful? Because you I think look so. Wonderful. Because for a minute there, I was kind of fading, and. Uh, then I got another job and I said, that's the problem, I need to be working. <laughs> <laughs> Work does keep you happy and keeps you alive. And um, like, I can't say it enough, like you're actually still working up until this very moment that we sit here and do this interview. You, uh, last year you did the live rendition of the Jeffersons with, with Jamie Foxx and, and, and Norman Lear, and that was hugely popular. Yeah, that was fun. I was actually supposed to play Mother Jefferson, and I was planning on doing that, but then Norman came and said, we're gonna make you do, we're gonna have you do Florence. Do you mind? I said, no. I said, anything I'm doing at this time, child, is fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I did her. And the thing about it was when I read it, it's the exact same script that I did on the first show. And so I never forgot it. I never forgot the blocking and the lines, nothing. So I didn't even have to take the script to the set. And, and, and younger actors and actresses, they all give you your praise and, and your props, such as Jamie Foxx and Regina King. What is it like for you seeing the generations that you inspired come after you and be, continue to be inspired by you? I think it's wonderful. It's very nice because people say, we love you, you don't, you don't understand, we love you. They don't say we like you, they say we love you. And most guys, big or little or old or young, say, I gotta have a hug. And so I hug them. 